and welcome to the U.S. Mental TV podcast. And today I am proud to have Harold Oyman on this show. He has made a movie called Murder in the Front Row about Bay Area Thrash, and he's a great bass player for DRI. And hi, how are you doing? I'm glad you came on. Awesome. Thanks for having me, man. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. It seemed like I, when we talked on the phone, it seemed like I've known you forever. Totally. We have a, we have a very similar outlook on life and a similar twisted sense of humor, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we're members of the 4F Club. <laughs> yes. Lifetime members. <laughs> Yeah, I did, I think, seven records called The Church of El Duce with Steve Broy, Heathen Scum. And um, sick, you played on a bunch of them. I played, I played guitar and sang on a lot of mm -hmm. them and sang on all of them. But uh, Steve's a good friend since 1985. With my head of this band called Evil Genius, who played in Seattle. And one of the guys, Chris Jacobson, who was known as Jake Shit, he... Uh, played second guitar, or he, he he was one of the, as Steve Boy, he says, Matt, I, I, after that last riot, I had, I figured I'd better get a second string so we could play the show so I won't get sued. And Chris was one of the guitar players that play, he played drums sometimes and played guitar, but so, man, it was so fun. We go to the strip club to get inspired for the lyrics. There was a strip club across the street from the studio, and Steve would come up to Portland to do it. But, uh, yeah, man, that's, and you've got some pictures in his book, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. The mentors are great. They were, they were always one of my favorite bands. And uh, uh, whenever they came to the Bay Area, they'd play Ruthie's or San Francisco somewhere. Um, we we just had a blast hanging out with Duce. Duce was the best, he was the best hang probably of all time. I don't think I've ever laughed so hard my whole life. Yeah. To, uh, uh, Ron, Ron Quintana had this um, uh Late night uh, radio show, uh, Rampage Radio, uh, from uh, KOSF at San Francisco University. And yeah. he had Duce on there a bunch of times with Hetfield and Fred Cotton and stuff. And it was like, those are some of the best nights of my life. I, I don't think I've ever laughed so hard my whole life. <laughs> they were playing at Satyricon one time, and then he says, Matt, uh, what you gotta do is you gotta shave your head down the middle like Bozo. <laughs> and, like uh, a reverse, uh, a re reverse he, mohawk, right? He, yeah. <laughs> I remember uh, the first time I heard that music, Tom Pig from Poison Idea played me The Mentors and Motorhead in the same day, and uh, it was M Day. And, uh, and it changed your life forever, right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm going through her purse. That was great. <laughs> but uh, so tell me about, uh, I don't know, what do you want to talk about? Uh, I don't know. A little bit about the book? Yeah. No, no, we'll, we'll, we'll wing it. We'll wing it here a little bit. Uh, yeah, about 12 years ago, I put out a book with my uh, my longtime friend, Brian Liu. We grew up in Sunnyvale together. And uh, he was one of the first, he was probably the first person ever heard of Metallica that, that turned me on and uh, turned me on to them and a bunch of people. And he actually brought me to one of your shows. Uh, it was Culprit Cinema and wild, with Mike Farney and, and Wild, wild Dogs. And so, and yeah, yeah. And August I probably would eat a gun. August no, 20, 1982, actually. That was, that was our first game. Yeah. That's amazing. You got a great memory. And uh, no, that was awesome. Brian turned me on to a lot of the early early uh, metal stuff in the Bay Area, Exodus stuff. And and um, him and KJ Downton and, and a bunch of other people had this huge tape trading thing going on. And uh, uh, me and Brian started taking photos at all the shows, kind of documenting stuff. Just, I mean, it was just fun. And I just started doing it because I would get so drunk or stoned or whatever, I would forget what happened at the show. So if I took photos, it would be, you know, bring stuff back, you know. And little did we know, like, 40 years later that, you know, Metallica would be, like, the biggest metal band of all time. Who would have thought, right? Yeah. And um, and about 12 years ago, um, I was talking to Monty Connor from Roadrunner, mm -hmm. the head guy from Roadrunner. I asked him if he knew any good publishers. And he said, I should talk to, to um, Ian Christie. From uh, he had his, this company called Bazillion Points, and uh, we hope we got together with him and we hit it off great. And he suggested that me and Brian collaborate because Brian's got the earliest Metallica shots pretty much ever of all time of the classic Mustaine and Cliff Burton lineup. And then uh, we worked on it for about two years. Picked up, I went through all my negatives, all 35 millimeter negatives, by the way. There's no, 
the only couple digital shots in there are, are the ones of us like more recently for the like the uh, the bios and stuff. But uh, every shot in there basically is from a thirty five millimeter negative. We went through all the negatives. Took took like two years, and then uh, it finally came out. It's been amazingly successful. We sold like I think sixty five. 67,000 copies of the book. Wow. And uh, yeah, I, I couldn't be happier. Me and Brian were so happy. Ian, Ian the publisher from Bazillion Points, he just did a fantastic job. And we didn't have any corporate bullshit. You know, it's like uh, KJ, KJ Downton, um, I'm sure you know, he um, he put out an earlier Metallica book called Metallica Unbound. And um, that was like Warner Brothers put it out or something. But he went through all this bullshit. He, he never... Uh, just, you know, financial stuff and all this crap. And uh, he didn't have the control over it like he wanted to, but we didn't want any, you know, you know we, didn't, we didn't want to go through that route. So Ian uh, was just fantastic. And uh, uh, the book came out, did great. And then fast forward a few years later, and Adam Dubin, who did a bunch of Metallica videos, uh, he did like a year and a half in the life of Metallica video. And uh, uh, he, uh, he, he saw the book and bumped into Brian at a uh, Metallica show in L.A., and talked about possibly doing a documentary. And then, so we started doing that, and then he ended up in, interviewing everybody here in the Bay Area. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, he did a great documentary. So the documentary is kind of like a companion piece to the book, basically. And, uh, yeah, we couldn't be happier with that, too. That, that came out great, too. And uh, we had a big uh, big uh, premiere at the Kabuki Theater in, in San Francisco, where a lot of the original metal shows happened and stuff. And it was the same day as Metal Allegiance, which has all the, basically all the, you know, the local uh, uh, thrash guys playing. And that was the same night. And that was fantastic. And uh, yeah, the, the movie and the book have done great. I mean, the reviews have been fantastic and it's amazing. It's amazing how many doors that thing has opened up for us too, you know, as far as just meeting people. And the book's been a great, uh, uh, it's almost like a yearbook, like all the Metallica, all, all the Metallica guys just love it. And uh, it could, it came out fantastic. I, I couldn't be happier with it. And here we are 12 years later, and I'm still turning people onto it for the first time. So, And, and yeah. we're talking about it today. Yeah, I love that movie. I also saw yeah, uh, Bay Area, Godfather's of Bay Area Thrash by uh, Bob Nalbandian. Yeah, Bob. Yeah, Bob. Bob was great. Uh, he, he's coming from a similar a similar uh, place as us, you know. Those are, uh, those are almost like, I, I look at those as kind of companion pieces. To the, to the murder of the front row. And then there's also a really cool uh, uh, documentary um, about the punk underground here in the Bay Area. It's really cool. So, I mean, it'd be great someday maybe do a box set with all those put together, you know. But, uh, yeah, things are still happening here. I just saw Raven last night with Vicious Rumors. And yeah. That was, Raven was just amazing. Man. It was I, ripping. I had John on the show. He's been on three times. Yeah, we, we played with Anthrax and Raven in 1984, and we were in a bar across behind the Starry Night, which is now called the Roseland. And he said, "Hey, mate, what's good to drink here?" And my friend John Donnelly said, "Oh, you got to order a thing called a bunch of booze," <laughs> which was a joke. And uh, we went over to the club, and he says, "Let's go over to the sound check." And um, Walk in, he goes, Where the, where's the bathroom? Where's the loo? And I said, right here. So I go, I can, man, I can always pee. I mean, I love to pee. But he walked in and he went, <laughs> to, he went to sit down. I thought, oh, I can, I can do that too. So we're sitting on the toilets next to each other and talking. And I thought, this guy is cool. He's going to be my friend for life. <laughs> and he yeah, asked of me. of course. Oh, I, lo yeah, I love Yeah, those, 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 those are the greatest guy. guys, man. Him the and Mark. warmest, nicest. Yeah, incredible. The greatest guys ever. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, I've gone to see them pretty much every time they played here. But, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're the nicest, most genuine, friendly, nicest guys you could ever want to meet. And, and uh, we've become pretty good friends over the years. And they just fucking rip. I mean, I think they're better now than they've ever been. The, the musicianship, and it's just fucking amazing, you know? I the can swear, drummer. right? The new drummer with oh, yeah. Mike Heller, really. This new album called Hell, All Hell's Breaking Loose is just amazing. Oh, incredible. And it's like we, one of the best things they've ever done. Last time we played with them was in 2010 in Portland. And um, I've had different lines. I didn't, I didn't see eye to eye with the Wild Dogs because they wanted to go like Rat. And I wanted to do, a, uh, on the second album, I wanted, I wanted to do a 
cover of Ace of Spades, and they go, we don't like, we don't like Motorhead, they're horrible. And I'm thinking, no, they're not. So I went home and wrote a song exactly like Ace of Spades and brought it to them. I go, wow, that's really great. <laughs> I never told them. Oh, that, uh, that's kind of interesting how that works out like it. Speaking of Wild Dogs, um, I, uh, I, got to, I got to meet uh, Dean Castronova at uh, a Merkins gig. This, uh, Merkins is a, a yearly thing that Phil Demo from Violent to Machine Head uh-huh. and now in Kerry King's band. He does this uh, great benefit every year. It's a thing called the Merkins, and it's like, like 60, 75, maybe I think it was like 80, 80 different musicians jamming on all these great cover tunes. But uh, Dean Castronova was there. And um, I always loved his drumming on that Geezer Butler album that he played on, the GZR oh, first yeah. album. G- fucking yeah. amazing. That Greatest was really drumming good. ever. Fucking so killer. And of course, with Journey, which is amazing. Who would have thought, right? From Wild Dogs to <laughs> Geezer to Journey, that's, that's amazing, right? So yeah. anyway, long story short, um, I got to meet him and I told him that I'd seen Wild Dogs at the Stone, you know, back on the, that day, what, 1982, whatever. And we just totally hit it off. What a great guy he is! Right? Oh, he is so fun, and he's he was like he's been on the show too, and I'll bet. <laughs> and he's it's Dean Castronovo, but he's so hyper. <laughs> he's like a mosquito. Oh, he's a ball of energy. Brrr, hey, man, he rolls up. Yeah, and funny too. One time, oh, we he played, was great. We played at the old Waldorf with uh, I can't remember the band. It was on Metal Monday. And here in San Francisco, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we stayed at the uh, hotel kind of by that tunnel. And um, the, the, the roadie had driven all the way down there and he was sleeping. And some guy called and said, Hey, where's Sean? He's supposed to be at this Denny's, like in Palo Alto or something. And walk him, wake his ass up and send him here. So before he did that, Dean had written on his face, Kill me, I'm a fag. And Put Frankenstein scars on him and all this. Dro- I mean, he really picasoed him up, and so he, he's just giggling like crazy. It wakes him up, hands him the keys, and says, "Here, you gotta go. Your friend's waiting for you at Denny's. You gotta go." And takes Dean's band with the drums and leaves. And we don't see him for about. We don't see him. The next, he started to, to come back to Portland. He's so angry. And uh, when he found out, when he walked into the Denny's, everybody looked at him. <laughs> But meanwhile, With the shit all over his face. Oh yeah, and yeah, I was pretty drunk and bored. And the bass player was in the other band with some girl, and I said, "Come on, let's go out and sing." And then, what are we gonna sing? And I said, "We're gonna sing Come All Ye Faithful" because he didn't. His, he kept saying, "Don't tell my girlfriend." So we were outside. In a semicircle, holding hands, going, come all ye faithful. He popped up like a, <laughs> like one of those games of Chuck E. Cheese's and banging on the windows. Don't do that. Just stop, stop. I hear the girl giggling. But, uh, yeah, that's, you know, me and Dean, I found Dean with Jay from Malice. I helped start Malice. You know those guys? Oh, wow. And, oh, yeah, uh, of course. Me and Dean played on uh, the first Malice demos. With, oh, I with, had no idea. With Kip Dorn, who was in lived in Santa Rosa, he was in a band called the Harlow, and we did the first like five demos that got them onto Metal Blade, be, mainly because um, he was trying to lure the guitar player and bass player into the band to move to L.A. But at my Ravers record album release, and I released that in 1981, it was like a new wave punk album. Um, they brought James Neal to the party, and at the party, there was a Tower of Power horn section. Kenny G, I was the only rock act on the album. Most of them were jazz. Kenny G spot. Yeah, and he, uh, what we call it. he went outside. James took a drink of beer and went outside, came back in about 20 minutes later, totally stark naked and covered in something, and went and grabbed another beer. And from the fridge, we're in the kitchen, and he smelled like oh, in my best Keith Moon. Like, oh dear boy, what's what's that natural odor? I've got you must tell me. It looks it's a good for your skin. And he told me what happened. He had taken a dump in the backyard and rolled in it, and uh, everybody's looking at him. And I thought, it was, you know, how punk rock is that? I mean, that's very, yeah, very, 
GG Allen uh, before. I, I was thinking you, you took the turds right out of my mouth, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there you go. And he ran off. So that's awesome. He ran down the street. It's February, so it's freezing. So he's running down the street totally naked. And Gigi Allen needs to send me my friend uh, Eric Frey, who played with Tom Pig from Poison Idea before Tom was in Poison Idea. He was a pen pal with Gigi, and he, he'd pay him like 100 bucks, and he'd send all these weird videos. <laughs> this was like yeah, just- back in 83. Yeah, Gigi Allen was a fucking trip, man. Uh, he gives a new meaning. He gives a new meaning to the term "the shit hits the fans," right? <laughs> the shit hits the mic. The mentors were on yeah. tour after them. They they were booked by the same person, and they followed him. And they Steve said, "We we got to the first gig, and it smelled like poop in there." And the sound man said, "Do you have beer and mics?" And we said, "No." Well, you better go buy one because buy him because the guy last night took a poop on all the mics. Oh God! Yeah, he was he was a wretched he was a wretched person, man. Um, we went and saw him one time just for the spectacle. Um, I never thought his music was that great. It's pretty substandard punk rock. But uh, me and Rob Flynn from Machine Head and yeah. a couple friends, we went we went and saw him in the city once, and uh, I think they only lasted three or four songs. Normally, the cops would come and shut the whole show down. But there was this band called the In Saints, and they opened up the show, and they had this uh, this female singer. It was hilarious. And um, uh, nicest guitar player ever, this guy named Daniel. But anyways, so they co- she comes out on stage dressed like a, dressed like a cop, like she's gonna, you know, like she's a real cop and she's gonna shut the whole show down, right? Some place in the city called Club No Name. I guess they were embarrassed to even have them there. But so she so she came out on stage and she pretends she's like breaking, uh, uh, gonna shut the show down. All of a sudden she starts stripping, and this is part of the show, and. Um, uh, so basically, she 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 gets down to her g-string, and she starts putting. Uh, uh, she pulls out this whole crate of bananas. She starts putting the bananas inside her her uh, her her uh, her snatch, you could say. And everyone's like, "What the fuck?" And they had, so basically, it was a total sex show where she gets fisted on stage and blah blah blah, and and it was just it was crazy. It was total mayhem. And then uh, Gigi Allen came on after that, and it was just like. Oh my God. I thought, I can't believe I actually paid money to see this stuff, but the smell of uh, that club, when he, oh my God, it was the craziest <laughs> thing ever. But I'm going, oh, this is foul. And it's like, we couldn't, I couldn't believe I paid, you know, 10 bucks, or whatever, to see this fucking, this fucking idiot take a dump on stage or whatever. But long story, short story long, long story short, um, there was two sets of stairs and a balcony. So I didn't want to be anywhere near the guy because I didn't want to get any dookie on me. There so is I no of- hiding at a G.G. Allen show, though. This is true. This is true. But anyway, so there's two sets of stairs. One, uh, you know, going up the balcony. All of a sudden, Gigi, he's got like a dookie in his hand. He comes running up the stairs. So <laughs> so me and a bunch of people are running for our lives, going down the stairs the other way. And what does he do? He doubles back the other way. So he's coming around now. All of a sudden, he's running towards us with a dookie. And I thought for sure I was going to be trampled with that. I was palpitating, and uh, oh my god, uh, this, this buddy of mine, Danny, this, this, this Danny from Reality Check, this local show here, I kind of used him as a human shit shield when he formed the poo, <laughs> and I ducked behind him and stuff. But uh, yeah, that was I seen GGL one time. That that was enough, you know. And um, yeah, he was a spectacle, man. I mean, uh, I guess he was just mad at the world because he had such a tiny peepee, you know. I mean, I'd be kind of pissed if I had micro penis too. But what are you going to do? You know, we're not going to get into that. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I asked. Uh, I heard, I used to do these interviews with Duce, and I asked him about you know uh, what's what's up with GGL and stuff. And, and Duce was usually too fucked to even too fucked up to even respond. You know. But uh, yeah, Duce, Duce, I, he was the best hang ever, man. And. Uh, uh, Ministry, uh, uh, Al Jorgensen wrote in his book, he met to Duce and he said he, he found him in the ba- in the bathroom at the war field, uh, passed out with his pants down around his ankles. And he said, that's the kind of guy I want to bring on tour with me. So they brought Duce out on tour for a couple of weeks, I guess, with ministry. And they had, they had a blast together. Like, can you imagine? <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, one thing I was going to ask you, because I know you're up, uh, I know you know Steve and, uh, Steve and Brian and Eric real well. What's your take on the whole... Ellen Wrench thing with uh, supposedly uh, he was the last person to supposedly see Duce alive and Duce supposedly gave up his name in that Kurt and Courtney documentary 
by accident, supposedly. And uh, what's your take on that? Do you think there's any any mention of truth that he he murdered Duce? And and, and and there's other weird shit that happened, too. I mean, I, I love conspiracy theories and all this shit like that. I, but, I'll tell you, I, I went to Amsterdam with Steve. I, I, we were recording the first time, and he said, you've never been to Europe? I go, no, but he goes, I'll buy you a ticket, you know, on his uh, travel points. And I went there, and it was with Alan Wrench. And the Alan Wrench band was touring that at the time. And I right. spent the week with Alan. He's a, he was a cop. He was a nice guy. He works for the police department. In Riverside, and um, as far as I know, or what I, what they've told me, it's that there's, it was a story for the star. But I, I in Duce, and Duce, when I had a band called Evil Genius, Duce and Chris Jacobson and Frick Kip Doran would go and sit for hours and watch the trains come into the into the stations. I right, think the forty ounces. Yeah, they sit on, sit on this on this overpass and watch the trains. So, and and Chris actually became an engineer on the railroad. So, Duce knew about trains, and I. Right, think, right. But he was really drunk when he walked down to the store that Steve said, and I don't you know I don't know how he couldn't hear the train. So I I I really don't think he. I don't think I think that's all part of the drama, the the legend. Of course, of course. I, I think he just fell. Yeah. So you don't think there was any kind of weird conspiracy with Alan Ranch? Because the no. weird thing is, the kind of strange thing too. Uh, me and me and my buddy, the, my guy, uh, heard from DRI. We used to have this theory. We thought it was kind of suspicious that Alan Ranch kind of became this. This. Uh, I mean, he he, he kind of took Duce's place in the mentors almost for a minute. It seemed like. And it just seemed kind of weird that here he's replacing this guy. And supposedly he was the last guy seen with him, you know, and he went and bought him a 40 ouncer. And then, of course, in the movie, the Kurt and Courtney movie, Duce actually uh, accidentally, supposedly, gives up uh, the guy's name that killed that killed uh, Kurt Cobain and said, Alan, oh, he goes, oh, I mean, so it was a, I don't know if that was, a, you know, you know what I mean? But, um, and of course, he had that band, uh, he had a band for a minute called uh, Courtney Killed Kurt. So I guess, yeah, they were just trying to get some good publicity out of it, I think, at the end of the day. But, yeah, that's really you know. what it was. It was a Star Star Magazine story that went berserko. And the right, way. it's the total Inquirer kind of like, a pop, uh, what is it, TMZ kind of like bullshit. Yeah. And they were just trying to milk it milk it for all it's worth, right? I think they got Which four, they did. 1400 bucks for the story. <laughs> yeah, and, and Duce supposedly took a lie detector test. Saying that you know that that it, he's telling the truth and blah blah blah. And it's just like I don't know. It's funny they they just try to milk that for all it's worth, you know. And Duce wasn't a very good liar either. You know? But Duce wasn't a killer. I mean, the guy. No, of course not. Of course the guy, not. The guy didn't have but that in him. But I know exactly the the fact that that supposed to she even asked him that. You know, it's like you said, it's just part of the lore and everything and the drama and stuff. But it kind of adds adds this kind of bizarre. I love I love conspiracy theories and stuff, you know. I just been watching the. Uh, I saw the other, the other night. I saw this Alex Jones versus the Truth. This guy that said that the Sandy Hook thing didn't happen. All this stuff just so he could sell his fucking vitamins on his website and stuff. What a fucking loser that guy is, man! And everybody's trying to grab any bananas they can, but uh, that's true. You know, that's true. Good point. When we uh, actually, I got Raven into the Ra- into the Mentors movie, uh, and oh yeah. And in 2010, when we played with Raven, we John said, "Come and dress with us." You don't, they, I get a better dressing room, so we're in there, and my guys were really cool, and we were just joking and talking and singing mentor songs so long. The guy, the stage guy, comes in. Hey, dudes, you're on stage. You're late. We walked out there and realized the guitar player was in a completely different tuning than my bass. And that's when oh, I was no. playing bass and singing. So we, about halfway through, I said, wait, stop. Something's wrong here. We didn't tune up. <laughs> so the whole night it was took, really funny. Then anyway, it, it, took, it, took, it took half the show before you realized you were out of tune. <laughs> no, just half a song. Oh, half a song. Okay. I'm going, All right. this doesn't feel right. And uh, in 2013, I went and I, I roadied actually for Raven and then... Um, 
April Jones, the person who made the Mentors movie, who is from yeah. Portland. She was going to he's, the college they worked at. She made the movie while she's a student. And uh, I said, you got to you know, get raved in, in the thing. And Joe Hasselfander had all kinds of stories, the, the previous drummer. And it was funny. And Steve Broy was in town that same day, so all of us were in the dressing room getting, you know, interviewed for the well, movie. Did- Oh, yeah, yeah. It was fun. Yeah, yeah, I miss Duce a lot, man. I, he was just the, the greatest hang. And, uh, Ladies uh, loved that guy. You know, people say, hey, he's I a know, sexist. strangely enough, right? You know, but, but he's, a, he's a lovable guy. Oh, he is. He's the nicest guy ever. And the, yeah. one of the funniest things was, uh, I'd go see him time after time, and um, you'd think he would, like, remember you, but you could kind of tell he doesn't really remember you. But, I mean, he meets so many people, but... Uh, I'll never forget, he made a hood one time right in front of me, I think out of a Sammy Hagar t-shirt or something, Inside Out, and he had to make the hood at the last second before he went on stage, and uh, one time he came to the city, too, I, I don't think it was, he, he just got a band together that afternoon, I think, or something like that, <laughs> and it was Bill, Bill was the mentors, it wasn't Steve, and, uh, Steve Roy or, or, or Eric Carlson, um, uh, it was just two other guys, and they got up there and they did like Johnny Be Good or something like that, and maybe like half a mentor song and then they walked off and it was, it was, it was, it was awful, but it was hilarious at the same time. You know what I mean? Yeah. And now uh, are you familiar with Gardy Lou by any chance? Oh, you know, I know. I, I did a gig with them in uh, Chicago, the, uh, yeah, yeah. the metal fest. Yeah. Those guys are great. Uh, nasty Savage guys, right? It's a couple of yeah. guys from Nasty Savage. Though. Yeah. Speaking yeah, of uh, the turd coming at you, but that was part of the stage act where a turd would come out in the audience. A guy dressed in a yeah, like, costume. Yeah, exactly. Like like a Gore kind of thing, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, those guys are great. They did they did an album with Duce. Uh what's it called? Yep. Turd Toilet. It's called uh Yeah. Stool it was Sample, a, I think. A, a right? Picture. I can't remember the name because I had the C D and the picture was Stool like, Sample. Stool Sample. Um taken from the That's toilet. A, or yeah. or Duce. it was a it was a really creative cover. Oh yeah, it's great. It's great, and it was it was so funny because here's Duce. Um, I guess they wanted to they wanted to do a whole album with him, and as long as they kept him um, drunk the whole time with forty ounces, that he was there for about a week, week and a half, and he did a whole record with him. But and the greatest thing is he starts rhyming toilet and spoil it again, using all his old same rhymes again and everything. It was classic stuff, man. But uh, it's probably I mean it's amazing how many uh, uh, how many uh, mutual friends we probably have. What about I was going to ask you. There was a guy named Gord Kirchen from a band called Pile Driver. Oh, I, I played in Germany with them at the Hensley Open Air. Yeah, he's, he died last year. Yeah, he was a great guy too, man. And he had a very similar sense of humor as me and you do and as Duce does. And he was a brilliant, he was a great guy, man. And I miss him a lot. I knew that you'd know who he was. I just knew it. Oh, yeah. We used, coming- we used to talk a lot. He's a big Pink Floyd fan. I know Zappa fan. Zappa, yep, yep. And yeah. we had the exact same taste in music. And he, he yeah, I just want to, I, I knew you'd know who he was. I knew for a fact. Because uh, uh, your Dr. Mastermind thing, that whole, it, it had a very similar pile driver kind of vibe to it, you know? This guy. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Really I, recognized. <laughs> I know, that was the idea. Uh, <laughs> there's a funny story about how I, I was called Evil Genius, but Barney said, no, we can't have the word evil. I go, have they metal? And he goes, yeah. I go, okay, how about Mastermind? And he goes, that sounds good. He researched the name, and there's another band out in the Midwest, and they said, you can't use our name. And it's like the name of a board game. And I said, I've got the solution. Uh, yeah, I've got the solution. I'll become a doctor. What? I said, if you put doctor in front of Mastermind, it's right. a different name. That like he did scum, right? <laughs> like he did scum. You guys probably both went to the same university where you got your doctorate or your PhD, right? Yeah, I think actually he has a PhD in electronic engineering. He's one of Does the six, he really? one of the yeah. He, the guy is brilliant. You know, he's one of the six people in the world that designs atmospheric analyzers for clean rooms. No way. Yeah, way. That's right? great. And yeah. when I saw him in '85, he had just gotten done with college. He goes, "Well, you know, as we moved to LA to do the rock and roll thing, and that wasn't working out, I was doing delivering that." 
the, I had a stroke and I'm thank talk really good. I was delivering papers in LA and my dad said, you should go to college and get a skill you can fall back on. So yeah, if your music career doesn't work out for you, right? I, I went, he said, I went to college and got my PhD. It's just like he's going to a, a 7-Eleven and picking up a burrito. I went to college and got my PhD, and he got a job at Lockheed designing the Stealth Bombers tracking system straight out of college for 150 grand. That's amazing. Yeah. Talk about Stephen Broy or Eric? Yeah, Eric? Steve Broy. No, not not Eric. He always looked kind of like a little bit of a nerd with the glasses. They cracked me up because it was almost like a Superman thing with a secret identity, right? Yeah, with the, the, the hood with the glasses poking out. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mentor's still going strong, man. Um, um, my band played with them probably about a year ago at a place called Toots Tavern in Crockett. And uh, uh, a buddy of mine plays guitar for them now. But, oh, great. Okay. I rolled out my window. See, I'm, I'm in downtown Oakland here. Wow! In front of in front of uh, Fairyland, Children's Fairyland. Uh, it's a beautiful day here. It's been raining all morning, and but uh, give you an idea how nice it is. It's like here's this beautiful wooded area and everything. But so I, it's 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 pouring here in Portland. Is it really? Of yeah. course. You live in you're up in Portland, right? Yep, Southwest Portland. Yeah, see, uh, Seattle, Portland, you guys get a lot of rain up there, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. That's why we're so good with all the instruments. <laughs> That's why your weed is so good up there, too. Yep. Man, I used to breathe oh, it. I good. made my own mix. Like, I could, uh, the guitar player for a uh, band called Gargoyle is also in Poison Idea, Kevin Sanders. <laughs> he gave me some of his, and so I crossbred a couple of them that were, well, really good. Now it's legal. It's I mean, it's more it's cheaper to buy it. It's yeah, like of course, of course. It's a good time to be a. It's a good time to be a pothead these days. Yeah, but uh, it's almost too strong, man. This shit's almost too strong. <laughs> Sounds like, like 80, 90 percent pure now, right? It's crazy. A Snoop Dogg movie. <laughs> yeah, Snoop Dogg's great. Awesome. Yeah, I, I I listened to Snoop Dogg Doggy Style when I worked when I first got this job at this college. I wrote parking tickets, and I was the most loved parking ticket writer ever. <laughs> I wasn't good at it, but I would listen to Snoop Dogg all day long while I walked for five hours up and down these hills. The, the campus was on a mountain. I was in damn good shape, but uh, yeah, I was yeah. I played her stuff I didn't like too well, but that first album, and it, Madonna was on the other side, so it kept me moving. You just split with Madonna? Like- yeah, it was like Madonna's best best hits or something. I had a tape with those two on there. and Or Greatest Tits, you could say. Greatest greatest Tits? No, yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly, exactly. She was milking but, it. Uh, yeah, um, you mentioned Poison Idea with, with Jerry. Um, uh, I love that Feel the Darkness album. It's one of my favorite albums of all time. And um, DRI, when I played with them, we did a couple shows with Jerry. Or I think Jerry, uh, he DJed a couple shows up in Seattle and stuff. But uh, they were amazing, I think. And they were a great hang. Uh, the, the old DRI bass player, Josh, Josh, Pay- uh, Josh Pappy, he, uh, he was like bass player number four or five. I was bass player number, number eight. Uh, but he got together with uh, uh, Pig Champion. Yeah, huge gentleman. Tom. And those guys, those guys partied till like the wee morning hours together, and uh, they were a great hang, man. I met him. He was friends with Mick Zane from Malice, and he'd always be over to the his That's house. A singer, right? No, the the guitar, Paul guitar player. Oh, okay, okay. And uh, Tom, Tom Roberts was big champion, and we got to be friends because we were getting to punk rock the same year, like nineteen seventy eight. Right. And, and we hung, went to, you know, I'd go to his house all the time. And he he was slinging cocaine and people were coming over and trading them guitar amps, like vintage Fenders and all these really, I said, you should learn to play those. And he said, oh, I can't do it. And I go, you can do it. And oh, like, it was like a pie shop? Yeah. Well, you like, yeah, uh, uh, yeah kind of like that. I wrote him out some how to do some two finger chords, and I knew we'd just take off on it. Our birthday was two days apart. We're the same age when uh, we got tickets to the Ramones, and we waited like three months to go see him at this tavern. 
They didn't say anything about being you know, over 21. But we got up to the door. I go, ID? And I go, here. Well, you, you guys aren't old enough. This is 21 and over. And it's like, what? Because they didn't have mixed shows in, back then. Right, of course. And so Tom says, let's go. We went and bought a case of Lone Brow, came back to my house. And he said, let's call a bomb threat in. And th that story okay, is in, in the Poison Idea movie called uh, Legacy of Dysfunction. Yeah. That's great. Uh, my mom loved so, Tom. She used to be a waitress at a Mexican restaurant, and, and Tom and Jerry would, uh, Pig and Jerry would come in. I mean, these guys were like three or 400 pounds at the time. I mean, Jerry, they were both Tom, big guys. And Tom was a waitress at a Mexican restaurant? No, my mother was. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. So I like go, to see that. What, do you know those guys? Oh, that's Matt's friends. I love these guys. And they would leave a pile of money on the table for a tip, and look, they look totally like bums. <laughs> I, produced, oh, I, I, I produced the first EP, Pick Your King, and then um, I hooked Tom up with Mike Barney, who, was, you know, Mike played in The Nuns. In yeah, Cinema? Yeah. Cinema that time? Yeah, well, when he was his band before that Rock was Justice. Rock Justice, yeah. and then before that, I think that was he was in the Nuns, and right, he, right. I said, "Can you help him get this record pressed up?" So he helped Poison Idea get their first record made. Wow, Mike Varney did. Yeah, that's amazing. I had no idea. Uh, Mike Bar cool I, like that. I love Mike Varney. He's a great guy. Yeah, without oh, he is a great guy. Without him, I, a lot of people. Speaking of Mark, uh, Mike and Marty Friedman and Megadeth, uh, yeah. Dean played on Marty's album, his solo album. The Dragon's Kiss? or Dragon, Yeah. And uh, what about Cacophony? Uh, I think he played on a couple songs. See, on Dr. Mastermind, I said, well, he goes, Mike said, see if you can get Dean Castro over to play. And I said, okay. And he said, sure, man, sure, I can do it. And I go, see if we can get Dean a, a job because he needs to get out of Portland. And so he, right. he got him into Tony McAlpine's band, paid, and these sessions like Marty and a Cacophony. And from there, he just kind of, I just knew once he got someplace where big timers were, they would take off. And oh, every, yeah, time, now, right? every time he talks He's to me, fucking... he goes, bro, thanks. I, would, no, I wouldn't be here without you. That, that makes me feel great. No, that's awesome. He's he's a fantastic guy. I don't think I've ever met anybody where I just met somebody and, and I hit it off so well with him. And uh, this, like I said, this Merkins gig when I hung out with him, um, we were like inseparable the whole day. Every time somebody would walk by, it's like, dude, you guys need to get a room or something, man. Because uh, I mean, it's like, I'm all, dude, we're talking here. Can you like butt out? But it was like, we had so much in common and stuff. And, um, uh, uh, it's so great that he he's he's doing much better now. I guess he had a bit of a little dark period there. Well, you yeah. don't get on TMZ by being a saint, <laughs> which I you know it's Sarah half of my mom. That's one of the benefits of being an only child. And uh, so yeah, I'm I'm about to take a shower. My mom goes, "Is that Dean?" Because she knows Dean really as well as I do. She calls he calls her my mom mom, and I go, "Your mom well, saw him on TM TMZ." Uh, yeah, I go. Yeah, okay. but he he looked better. He didn't look so much like Nick Nolte. <laughs> yeah, he had done a uh, about a three week bender with a bunch of meth and totally went berserk on his house and broke all of his gold rec records and destroyed the house and somehow yeah, I heard somebody I heard called crazy stuff. the tabloids and uh, you know he did some full time in jail and lots of time in the rehab and and they he lost some bunch of stuff and uh, well it's great that like Neil Sean gave him another chance you know and, and, and said come on back and uh, you're, you're glad you're doing good I saw a show that he did he did with all the, the journey journey through time yeah San Francisco we great they played all the old journey stuff oh my god that was one of the most amazing shows I've ever seen in my life it was incredible when we did the second Wild Dogs album Greg Raleigh was doing his first solo album at the same studio Prairie Sun oh really have you oh, ever right right do you know Prairie Sun? Yeah, and Cotati there? Uh, yeah, I talk, talk, talked to uh, Mooka last week, and he said they closed up and moved out. So it's, Yeah, they were there a long time, man. Exodus did their album there, I think, and a lot of history there. I recorded there with Kiss Band Harlow in 1980. 
Wow. And I thought, wow, awesome. this place has got a gate. That's pretty cool. But uh, yeah, it yeah. was a nice place. I remember. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, we but stayed there too. And- Mike, Mike Varney, we got to give Mike Varney props too. Like we were talking about Mike earlier, um, and he was in that you know the Rock Justice. There's some yeah. great songs out. Rock Justice got Phil Kenimore from Y&T, a Leonard Hayes from Y&T played the the judge, and I, I used to bump into Mike all the time at uh, Amoeba in the city, the record store there, and we'd be like the last guys in the store because you know they're trying to close up. And I told him, I go, dude, that Rock Justice album's great. He's all, you think so? He was, he was kind of embarrassed by it. I'm going, dude, there's some fucking ripping songs on there, man. Um, and I, I love the theatrical aspect of it, you know. So I asked him if that was ever going to be released because I know they they filmed it, right? There was a movie, a DVD of it and stuff where they filmed it with all you know all the chaos on stage and everything. And he said, he goes, he hopes nobody ever releases it. And then uh, fast forward six months later, I found a copy of it at some used video store that was going out of business. And I, and, uh, I seen him again after that. I'm like, Mike, I found the the, the 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 DVD of the Rock Justice. He's all, oh, please don't show that to anybody. I'm all, dude, what are you talking about? That's amazing. There's some great shit out there, you know? Yeah, that he told me that the, my Ravers record came out the same time that rock justice is he had that my, my first record i saw i'm you know i saw mike barney the first time i was watching mtv you know good thing to be unemployed and uh jc jackson said go get a pen and write down this address because if you got a band with a great guitar player this guy's looking for a band with great guitar players okay so i did and it was mike barney and we um the, the guys, would be, well, Pete Holmes from Black and Blue and me and Mick Zane from Malice and the guitar player from Wild Dogs, I, they they joined my Ravers band because the drummer had shot somebody on the TriMet bus. And so oh, wow. I, had, I had all these shows to do. So we did a couple of gigs like that. So they'd learn my songs. And then after the summer, Jeff said, hey, my girlfriend's sister is going to be in a recording class. So one of... You got songs. I go, yeah. So well, why don't you play with us? And I was playing guitar at the time. And uh, we went and recorded a couple songs as a demo. And I said, let's send. And then I saw Mike Barney. I said, let's send him a tape. I said, well, we don't have a band picture. I go, forget the band picture. Use one of your weirdo porn shots. So we, he had some <laughs> couple of people in latex outfits doing something to each other. And we put that in the cassette tape player um, box. And sent that to him. He, he wrote us a letter a couple of days later. And uh, yeah, he had that call of a guitar player, right? It was a guitar yeah. spotlight or something. And he 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 actually not to interrupt, but uh, I have to interject. He actually pretty much discovered Ingve Malmsteen through Ron Quintana, who I saw. I guess gave Mike Varney, or uh, he heard uh, Mike Varney heard Ingve on uh, on the uh, Ron Quintana's radio station. Yeah, exactly. And that's how he may end up coming to the States and playing with Steeler, right? I told, he played me that demo over the ta- over the phone. We, we used to talk wow. all the time. And I said, you got to get that guy. That's the sound I've been looking for. I heard that sound right. on a classical radio station when I was 11 years old, except it was a clavichord. I called the radio station and the guy said, that's not a guitar player. That's a keyboard. Right, you right. Know, well, whoever can do that on a guitar is going to be like the next Jimi Hendrix. And, and look, look, and look what happened, right? Look Ingo. what happened. So yeah. for Dr. Mastermind, I wanted Ingve first because we had been friends. And he was out of the country for like eight months and Barney wanted to do the record. It was, I got another guy, Paul Gilbert. And Paul was a little bit dry for me. Plus he really played like Van Halen and I wanted to have the classical thing. So he says, right, how, right. About, how about the guy that replaced Ingve and Steeler? Well, that works. And me and Kurt James have been friends ever since. Yeah, I remember him. I remember running, uh, yeah, he plays Sing Bay, right? Yeah. He plays a lot like him. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, very, very similar. Small world. I mean, it's amazing how many how many mutual friends we probably have and stuff too, right? I mean, like talking to you on the phone, like we're talking now, it seems like I've known yeah. you for my whole life. Exactly, exactly. And we're, we're making this, we're, we're connecting the dots here. And there's like so many dots to be connected. It's it's amazing. We might have to do a second one. Yes, for sure, for sure. But no, I I, I love talking talking music and and uh, um, and every 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 little reference to any 
little band or the most obscure uh, Mike Varney reference or everything, you're like right there, dude. I'm impressed by your depth of knowledge, you know? Very, very uh, impressive. I'm a sieve. <laughs> all, yeah. I got, all I got is stories, so... <laughs> No, that's great. I appreciate you having me on. This has been very enjoyable so far. Oh, man. When I talked to you online on Facebook, it was like, this guy would be great. And, yeah. I, how, how many times have you seen Guar? I, they played, do you, are you from, familiar with a club called Satyricon, Portland? Yeah, yeah. I played up there with DRI a few times. Yep. Guar played that the first time they came through. That's a small... Yeah, they, played Gil, they, played Gil, they played Gilman Street in... Uh, in Berkeley, which is the tiniest little punk dive ever. And this is back when it first came out. And uh, 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 this great friend of mine, Rissa, Rissa Schiff, um, she was a security guard for Bill Graham. And she was the head of, she, she was the lady that, that, that checked everybody's passes to go backstage to the Warfield. She turned me on to Guar when they first came out. And uh, they've been one of my favorite bands ever since then, too. I was buddies with, uh, with Casey, Casey Orr, the bass player. He's a, um, a, a I can't remember his fucking stage name. Uh, was it Jaws of Death? No, his stage name was fucking uh, with War. Yeah. <laughs> but something, the Jaws of Death, and I can't remember. That's Balzac. That's the guitar That's player. That's it. Okay. Well, that. Uh, hey, did you did you go to Motorhead at the Old Waldorf in 1981? No, I, I missed that one. The first time they came there, yeah. Uh, I, I, know, I know about it, but I, I was there. that was a huge deal. Yeah. That was with Brian Rock. That was with Fast Eddie, right? Who? That oh, yeah. Fast Eddie, yeah, the, the, the Ace of Spades lamp. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Animal I, and, I missed that. And the, a band called Ranger opened that became Night Ranger later. And my friend Kip was roommates with a guy named Bill Church who played bass in Montrose. Montrose, of course. The and Electric he, Church. He was running the sound, and Ronnie Montrose was running the front of the house. That's amazing, dude. And, I went and then, with, of course, much. I went with Mike, Mick, Mick Zane and me were down visiting Kip, and um, we went to the city on 4th of July and saw Squeeze and D.E. Smith, and there's a sign, a cardboard box that was just, it said Motorhead Monday. I go, we got to come back for this, and we came That's back. That's how you and, found out about the show? Yeah. That's all. T.E. Smith, not from Saturday, Saturday yep. Night Live. It's yes. Like Moon Alice, right? Yep. His wow, band. what a small world. Yeah. We he used to fuck the fuck out of me. We uh, <laughs> we slept in the harbor in Mike's van because was, we were too drunk to drive home. back to, up to Waiting Saturday. for that show, the motorhead show? No, just after the, the squeeze show. But I thought, wow, awesome. they, have a, they have alcohol and underage people in the same club? That was yeah, unheard exactly. of. Oh, yeah. They, yeah. Back then, you had to buy a drink ticket. Um, and then that made it okay. And then, well, I guess they separated, sometimes they separate the crowds, you know, the drinking yeah, section. Yeah, rope. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. You can, you can easily pass drinks over to uh, to the other side, you know. That's one of the things, that, like like the early Metallica days, when I first started taking photos of them and stuff, it's like, we used to just get so hammered. I mean, it was like, it was it was ridiculous. And I would drive them around. And there was a couple times when I'm, 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 I'm amazed we didn't kill ourselves. I mean, I'm seeing like two, two lanes on the freeway, not sure on which one, but uh, uh, a lot of that's really foggy because uh, we drank so much to excess, you know. Lars had his fucking uh, Pepsi and lemon. And uh, yeah, we had this just massive drinking sessions. Now everybody's, uh, everybody's uh, matured a little bit. And they, uh, all the, all the, all the, uh, People that can handle their alcohol still drink like I do because my mama didn't raise no quitter. But, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, Headfield's totally sober now. And I guess Lars is totally sober. There's a picture of Lars in the book doing a big pile of cocaine that I thought was perfect put in the book on a Michael Shaker picture using a toilet paper roll as a snorter. <laughs> and um, they had this uh, they had a reunion party at their old house in El Cerrito not too long ago on record store day. And um this is their tiny little house. It's called the Metallica Mansion. The Metallica Mansion, 3132 Carlson Boulevard in El Cerrito. And they were able to, to rent the house from the person who lives there now. And they had a huge keg party. And I thought it'd be great to recreate the photo of Lars doing the Coke in the bathroom again. <laughs> so long story short, I went and got a little bit of Coke. And I, I got a Michael Shanker photo, similar to the one that we had used then. I got a little toilet paper roll. 
And I said, hey, Lars, since we're here at this house again, you know, after years and years, we have to go to the bathroom and recreate that photo from my book of you doing the big pile of Coke on the Michael Shaker picture frame, right? So he's like, yeah, it sounds great. It sounds great. We'll do it. So um, the day goes on and, and he goes, we'll do it at the end of the day before I leave. So I, we go to the bathroom. I start breaking out the Coke. He's like, what are you doing? I'm all, I'm laying out the Coke. We're going to do recreate this photo from the book, you know, of you doing the Coke back in the day. And he looks at me, he goes, are you out of your fucking mind? He goes, I have fucking kids. I can't fucking do that shit now. Are you, are you crazy? <laughs> So, so it was a big misunderstanding. So he goes, I'll tell you what, give me your camera and I'll just get photos of you doing it. But uh, yeah, he didn't want to, he didn't want to recreate that photo, you know, cause he's like an upstanding guy now and he doesn't do Coke anymore, but uh, it was a big misunderstanding, but I tried to get him to recreate that photo. And of course it wasn't happening. He wasn't having it. But so uh, that's one, one thing I got to say about the Metallica guys. Uh, people talk so much crap about them on Facebook and on, on the internet and stuff. They, I mean, when it comes down to it, they're, there's nobody like them. I mean, they, they flew me and 150 of their old friends to uh, Cleveland for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction. They paid for everything. They paid for the airfare, paid for the hotel, and, and I had one of the best weekends of my life. And who fucking does that kind of thing? Nobody does that. They paid for everything. And uh, you got to give them props for, for being like orig- coming up with these great original ideas like that. Oh, you know? man, they, they totally, you know, played the music I liked. Oh, yeah. And I mean, I always wanted, I wanted to do, you know, faster and louder. And the guys I was with weren't having that. And once yeah, I started sure. playing metal, the people in the punk scene didn't want to have anything to do with me. And, uh, well, but, I mean, it started crossing over. You think, you think, I mean, yeah. it, it became a lot, a lot more acceptable like years later, right? You know? Yeah, but so uh, you're onto something there, I think. I was, yeah, I was a little too early. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. But you know, but, I, mean, that, I can't, I, I can't say enough good things about the Metallica guys, though. Like, to, the, no. to this day, what band stays together all the and that never changes, and they don't have million side bands. I mean, Lars in you know, one movie says, "I've been in one band." I mean, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. And, it takes I mean, that. And the- I kept saying to my guys, "Look, we got to not keep trying to please." people who don't like us we gotta just keep making the music that we make no that's not popular i go nothing is until you make it popular and if you stick with it the integrity sells itself and that's what exactly. metallica totally had oh for sure for sure for the longest time it and it, i mean it's just i still trip when i hear them on the radio because they're like you know hear my old friends on the radio and when i first started getting a little popular and played them on the radio it would blow my mind that these guys I kind of grew up with and used to party with, they're, they're playing them on the radio now. And, and uh, I mean, they opened up the door for thrash and so many things. And uh, I just can't believe so many, so, many, so many people talk shit about them. And it's yeah. like those first three albums are like, they set the bar so high on those, on those albums. Those albums are just magical. But and people Clint do Burton that with, with, with every band. They only, they don't sound exactly the same as they did with the first time. Well, you, you're an artist, you're a musician, you got to grow or you're going to not want to do it anymore. Exactly. What's the point of putting out the same record over and over again, like ACDC or something, right? And when I saw them on, on TV when, with a new album, that yellow one, it's, the fucking shit's really good. You know, and it's speaking, of kids, speaking of kids and Lars, I saw him in bed with Jackie Hughes and, and get him to the Greek. Oh yeah, <laughs> they're the cameo, right? Yeah, and you know, always, always <laughs> reminds me of that uh, the sign you see in every Seven Eleven: pregnancy and alcohol and mix. Well, how do you think you, they get pregnant? Yeah, exactly, exactly. But no, it's great. I still, I still bump into them once in a while around town and stuff. And uh, greatest guys ever, man. I can't say enough good things about them. You know, Steve I mean, Boyd said they put guys. him on. The, Steve says that they put him on the guest list whenever they're playing in L.A. The men- oh yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Hetfield, they, uh, they just love the mentors. You know, they're standing they used to up, hang out with Al Duce. Well, they were on the same label, Slagle's label. Yeah, exactly. They started off on Middle 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 Blade. That's correct. Exactly. Yeah. So right, man. Awesome, I, man. Somewhere in the space, but I still have a a copy of New Heavy Metal Review. Brian Slagle's magazine, right? Right. Yep. And yep. 
It had, uh, it's amazing how that turned into a record label, right? The, the uh, whole empire, like, so to speak. And I, I was shooting bands for my TV show in the 90s, and my girlfriend and I went to L.A., and so I thought I'd stop by Metal Blade. So I went to the address that I had. It was a post office box place. I oh, no. Up, I go, hey, man, this is like some mail by, oh, you know, yeah. We don't put the real address on there. So told me where, we, where it was, and I went to some office park just up the street. Yeah, Brian's awesome. Oh yeah, I talked to him. I tried to I tried to get a hold of him to get uh, people at Metal Blade to get people on my show, and every email I got got returned. It says can't it can't be uh, sent. That's weird. Yeah. Oh well. Yeah. No, it's amazing. It's just like Ron Quintana had his Metal Mania fanzine, and and uh, Bob now 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 Bandini had the, what the Headbanger, I think, right? It was. Yeah, it's man, amazing he, how, how this group of people like he you know, died. They turned it into. They, you know, yeah, of course, it's sad. He was a, he was a great guy, man. He was he was I, he <clears> come out all the way up from L.A. To, to the shows here in the Bay Area. And he was he was he was one of the early trues, you know, so to speak. You know, I met him and, uh, when he when they did. There's a magazine called Art Shock America. Oh yeah, of course. By Lee, Lisa Lee, and her. Yeah, sister. very familiar with. I, I had some of my stuff in there. Yep, and Nigel. They, I, I was living next door in a boathouse next to these guys, and I had a Wild Dog shirt on. This English guy says, Wild Dogs, I like that band. I go, what's your name? Nigel Skeet. And he said, we're doing a magazine right here. And that was right when I, I was in Mayhem with uh, Steve Hanford from Poison Idea, uh, a thrash band called Mayhem. The, the album was called Burned Alive. No relation, right? No, no, we didn't. Okay. Don't kill our parents or our friends. <laughs> no, I took. I'm Norwegian. I'm Norwegian, so I, I, I had to. I had to say that. I'm sorry. I uh, introduced Steve to Tom, uh, Big Champion, and they all joined Poison Idea after we did the record. And that's uh, awesome. I had no idea that you had that much history with those guys. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I I produced the, produced the first recordings before Poison Idea, and then I actually moved Tom's. I picked up all the Poison Ideas gear and moved it out to his house because I had a station or a Cadillac at the time and I picked it all up at down this place called Clockwork Joe's. Wham. Yeah, man, I couldn't hardly even move my mouth. I'm, and nobody, I'm sure there was people going, yes, he can't talk. He shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been taking that. I get, that, I, I get I, that sometimes too. <laughs> <laughs> hey, too bad. You know, yeah, I used to be shy. You don't like what I have to say, you don't have to listen, right? Right, no one's forcing you to listen, yeah. And there's, yeah, you don't just, I, I'm not paying you to stand here, exactly. exactly. <laughs> and you're not paying me, so there's the door, exactly. Exactly. So, real quick, um, I, I kind of, um, uh, if I could go over a couple of things that I've been doing more lately, more recently, yeah, yeah, let's do that, yeah, that'd be great. Um, See, so I was with DRI from 1999 to 2017, and almost 20 years, and um, I recorded one EP with them, four songs, and um, yeah, it's kind of weird. It's, it's kind of a bummer the way it turned out. Um, long story short again, basically my dad was dying of cancer, and uh, so uh, he didn't have that long, that, that much time to live, and so I talked to Spike, the guitar player, you know, founder of the band, he said that uh, it, would be, it would be bad if, if I went on the next tour and in the middle of the tour, I'd have to go home and go to my dad's funeral. So basically, he kind of talked me into uh, taking the time off and uh, you know doing this thing with my dad. And then my dad passed away, of course. Then when it comes time to rejoin the band, uh, then he, they, they didn't want me back after that. So it was kind of trippy. Um, and I was like the most sociable guy in the band. I'd be the guy that I would go to the keg parties till like you know six in the morning with total strangers in these random towns and, you know, they'd be back in the hotel sleeping and I'd be the guy out there, you know, doing public, uh, public relations, so to speak, you know? So I don't think they liked that part of it, you know? And, um, I guess I found out just recently too, that when my book came out, a uh, spike said that I got like a huge head and my ego got huge and everything. I was hard to handle after that. And, uh, um, <laughs> I don't see it. I, yeah, well, it's weird. It's kind of weird the way it turned out, but uh, 
So uh, we kind of had a bad party, you know, unfortunately. But for, for like 18, 17, 18 years, I did the DRI thing. It was like, I, I had a blast. I got to go around the world, play these huge festivals in South America and stuff. And it, it was fantastic. So, so that kind of fizzled out. And then uh, I had been grooming this gentleman named Greg Orr. Uh, I was thinking of bailing, you know, quitting myself for, for like, a, a, you know, for probably a couple of years before that. We'd go on these wild tours where uh, we'd almost drive off the side of a cliff and fucking blizzards and snowstorms and, it was getting too stressful and stuff. So anyway, so he ended up taking my place and it's all good. They're still going strong now. And, um, I got me and Spike don't really get along very much anymore, unfortunately, but, uh, it is what it is. And then, uh, so I hooked up some, with some old friends of mine, um, in Castro Valley, some old friends of Cliff Burton and stuff. And, uh, buddy of mine, Joe Cabral, it's an uh, old drummer pal of mine. We started just playing some original stuff and we started a band called Jesus crisis. And that's kind of what I've been doing the last four or five years since I left Great DRI. Band. Yeah, thanks, thanks. And it's kind of like stoner, Sabbathy kind of stuff. We got an album coming out. We just finished uh, with a, with a, uh, a buddy of ours, Snake Green, who used to be in Skin Lab. And so that's coming out soon. So keep an eye out for that. And then I was with this band called Blind Illusion for a couple of years, which was uh, the band that had Les Claypool from uh, Primus and Larry from Possessed and Primus. And uh, that was pretty cool. And they're just amazing. They did this one record for. Uh, uh, what was a fucking label. It was called The Sane Asylum. And that's one of my favorite albums of all time. It was great. I got to jam with them for a couple of years. And then I started a Black Sabbath tribute band called Backstabbath. And uh, did that for a couple of years. And then uh, the other night I did my very first solo performance, a Weird Harold O, I call it. <laughs> and it's me doing a bunch of Weird Al type parody songs of, uh, of uh, like we got the Paul McCartney song, Live and Let Die. We did that. But it was chicken pot pie, and I took a bunch of a bunch of Elton John songs. Uh, we are like, uh, yes, exactly. Goodbye Yellow Brick Road became Goodbye Really Big Load, and then uh, <laughs> yeah, just a bunch of weird shit like that. So I'm, that's what I've been doing. A uh, buddy of mine down the street here, this guy named Tom Gears, he's got a studio. So we've been just we've been just doing all these weird karaoke type things where I just change the lyrics that's and make great. them as in as fuck. We did a we did a, a cover of the song for the producers, Mel Brooks movie. Uh huh. The springtime for springtime for Hitler. Are you familiar uh, with it? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm a big Mel oh, Brooks yeah, fan. Yeah. yeah, we did springtime for Donald, and I dressed up like Donald Trump. And <laughs> they, they blew my head off on stage and everything. So that was great. So things are looking up, and like this last couple of weeks, but the one of the best couple of weeks of my life. I had the best time ever. I had my 61st birthday party at the Cornerstone, and I hired some girls to dance behind me and sing and. Uh, I just had the best time ever. So things are looking up. Uh, I'm probably the happiest I've ever been right now. My whole life, just about. So, When's your yeah. birthday? Uh, it was uh, March 29th, just the, the other day. Oh, last week, so. happy birthday. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. As a tattoo says, better, better late than never. Exactly, exactly, exactly. But so, that, that's yeah. how the mentor started. That's what Steve said. We are trying to be a bona fide cover band, but we are so shitty that Dooch would sing some different lyrics to try to get us fired. And it worked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Look at them now, right? Exactly. Hey, did, hey, you, uh, well, hey. did, you, did you know the guys in Trauma? Um, I, not, I didn't really know them that, that, but, um, at but the, all. The but singer... The, but the, the, the singer for Vicious Rumors, Brian Allen, uh, he did the last trauma record about two years ago. He sang for him. He's yeah, he's he's in the band. I got Brian the job with Vicious Rumors, and he's oh, my sure. he's my friend from up here. I also got him a job driving the bus at in a college I worked at. But yeah, yeah, so, the trauma guys are cool. Um, uh. We, uh, they had a Cliff Burton day that they have every year to celebrate Cliff Burton's uh, birthday. And um, I jammed on a couple of trauma songs with them recently at, uh, I think it was about a month ago, a month and a half ago in Castro Valley. But I got to know like Mike Overton and stuff. And those guys are great guys, man. Greatest guys ever. Oh. But that's a different trauma. That's kind of a different, there's there's a new trauma that's more thrash. Yeah. It's kind of like a traditional trauma. It's the older guys, so. But a small world again, you know? Yeah. But so the the album is called Jesus Crisis. Oh, that's the band. It's called the band's called. What's the album called? The album's called Superstar. Jesus Crisis Superstar. That's great. Exactly. 
<laughs> I love your sense oh, yeah. of humor. I like you, man. I'm really glad we Likewise. got to do this. Yeah, same here. I appreciate you having me. Oh. Um, let's do this again sometime. Okay, great, man. And good luck with everything you're doing. And uh, just keep having birthdays. That's my yeah, I wanna, advice. Yeah, that's, what, that's all you can hope for, right? Right. And on a, on a final note, I'd like to thank everybody that supported the book and that bought the movie and that, that got into it and stuff. And uh, I really appreciate it. It's, got, it's done amazingly well. So. The book is Murder from the Front Row on the Bay yes. Area thrash scene done by Harold and Brian Liu. Harold. Exactly, exactly. And uh, uh, the book's available on Bazillion Points Publishing and the, the movie you can get online from, uh, and the director is Adam Dubin. And uh, yeah, check it out. And, and yeah, fuck yeah. And the, the book again also is available on Amazon. I saw it on there. Exactly, exactly. And thank you so much for having me, Matt. Uh, oh, you're welcome. great. I'm Very blown nice. away by how many. Well, yeah, like I'm blown away by how many mutual friends we have and everything. It's it's incredible. And every time I drop some some obscure band name, you fucking knew exactly what I was talking about, and you had stories and know these guys too. So that's great. <laughs> we have a lot in common. I think really cool. Got nothing better to do. Well, thank you. I think I appreciate it. We have a lot in common, man. Yeah, let's do it again. Oh. Yeah, for sure, sure. Like I could go on for for days, but oh yeah, uh, and I, I can't, yeah. <laughs> We're match, we're match made in heaven. <laughs> or in hell, depending on how. Yeah. I, I like well, that better. Okay. Well, anyway, let's yeah. take it I'll take off now and thank you very Harold. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I got cotton out from hell here. So uh, Yeah, so yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks a lot, Harold. Harold Oyman from the RI and Jesus Crisis and Fuck yeah. Murder from the Front Row. There's a, a the movie the is front row. the movie is on Tubi. You can watch it and then you want to buy the book. And vice versa. Yeah, it's actually free. I think. Yeah, it is. You can't beat that. No, I love I love Tubi. Awesome. And when is this going to be on? When 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 will I be able to watch this back? Um, I'll probably have it up tonight. Are we live right now. No, awesome. I'll, I'll, That's I'll quick. cut it and put it up tonight. That's great, man. Thank you for your time, Matt. I really enjoyed oh, this. Thank you for yours. Yes, and and, and uh, we'll keep in touch. And uh, I really appreciate it, man. Thanks for watching, everybody out there, too. Stay heavy. Uh, fuck Molly Crew and fuck Poser Rock and long live the mentors. <laughs> yeah. The 4F yeah. Club will live forever. Yes, the 4F Club alumni. Fuck On your out. face, I'll build a tower of... <laughs> Dookie. <laughs> yeah, you know what it is. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll see you later. Thanks. thanks. Matt. Yeah, Bye. I appreciate it. That was fun. Thanks yeah. for thanks for watching. Thanks for having me. Bye. Have a great afternoon. You too. Thanks, bro. Sign it out. <laughs>